Hello and welcome to FPV Reviews. My name is Spike. This you probably remember if you follow the show is the Skywalker 1900 by BEVRC.com. We did a review episode on it a while back where we showed you the components that were being installed in the airplane including the Immersion RC Easy UHF control system. It's a UHF long range control system and it's sold by ReadyMadeRC.com and honestly it didn't work that well when I put it in. We did find a, a problem with the, with the system itself and there was mostly uh, what I didn't know and what I'm here to talk to you today about. These lower frequency systems are a lot more susceptible to noise on board the airplane than say the old 2.4 gigahertz spread spectrum systems. They are a spread spectrum system but due to being a lower frequency there's a lot more things that can artificially generate a lower frequency on the board our own airplane that we really don't want and they can really interfere with the system and cause you not to get the range that you should be getting out of it and that is advertised by the manufacturers. Now this is no fault of the, typically of the system itself and if you didn't know better uh, you would put it in the same way you did a 2.4 system and like me you'd fly only about two or three kilometers and you'd have a control system lockout. So I'd like to share with you today how to set up this UHF system on your FPV plane to get the best control signal and the maximum range out of your airplane. You've probably seen lately I've been uh, putting up some long range videos, some very high altitude videos. Uh, we've flown this plane now with the modifications up to 8.6 kilometers away and we've range tested it over 10 kilometers. So now that I have it working properly I can share what I've learned and hopefully save you a lot of time and effort. You may have heard the term RFI kicking around. Radio frequency interference. We care a lot about this because it can degrade the performance of our UHF system. Where does it come from? Well, common sources are video transmitters, switching regulators, such as the type in some OSDs or mini cameras, even your BEC. Also, mini cameras are a source of RFI. In short, any device which can run off a range of voltages is a probable source of RFI. RFI can enter your system in several ways that you may not think of. The obvious one is the receiver antenna, but also can enter through the servo wires, directly into the back of the receiver, through the back door of the receiver, if you will, and also can enter the receiver body directly. We hear a lot less about EMI, electromagnetic interference, but it can do the same thing. It can generate noise in our system. Where does it come from? Well, usually it comes from electric motors, so we can kind of predict where it might show up. And it can enter the system the same way. The first thing that we should do for any of these problems is to relocate the receiver. Get it away from all those noise-making components. Putting it in the tail is a good uh, spot, or the wingtip. But the main point is to get physical separation of the body and antennas of the receiver from onboard sources of EMI and RFI. This also makes it so you can use very, very short antenna extensions or coax cable from the receiver to the antenna. The video transmitter can make a lot of noise, so get it far away from the UHF receiver and its antennas as possible. Separate the power wires from the signal wires. Group the red and black together and the yellow and white together and run them separately. Install a capacitor for extra protection in the power supply for added noise suppression. Observe polarity. The capacitor usually has a black stripe. The corresponding wire coming out of it should go to the negative or black wire feeding power to the video transmitter. This is the capacitor that was recommended by a friend in the electronics uh, business for this job. It's a 100 rating K 
capacitor, and this particular one was good for up to 50 volts, although we're only running 12 volts for power supply. Now that the receiver is in the tail, you'll be running a wiring harness back to it from the main body of the airplane. In the case of the Skywalker or other pusher planes, this has to go right past the motor, another source of EMI. So, shield the wiring harness for the UHF control system, especially where it passes the electric motor. You can do this with thin strips of aluminum foil. If practical, shield the entire wiring harness. Also use ferrite rings to suppress the noise on all noise-making devices. These could be cameras, ESCs and BECs, and things like your video transmitter. In short, anything that has a switching voltage regulator. Try to get the ferrite ring as close to the noise-making device as possible. Ferrite rings can also be put in all the wires that plug into the back of the receiver for further protection. To make this easier, group all of the positive and negative wires separately, except for one of each in the body of the plane and solder them together, making a common point up in the body of the airplane like this, so that there's only one positive and one negative wire running back to the receiver in the tail, plus of course the signal wires. This will reduce the number of ferrite rings that are necessary. Servos in the tail may not need this type of protection, such as the servo in the Skywalker that operates the elevator and the one that operates the rudder. But you can protect them anyway, if you like. It costs less weight to use more small rings instead of one big one. So use one for each signal wire, one for positive, one for negative, wires individually. Try to get at least four or five turns around each ring with the wire. Use the smallest ring possible. Ferrite rings can be purchased from any electronic store or salvaged from things like computers or inverters. Another thing that can help improve your range of your system drastically is to use dipole antennas for the receiver. Dragon Link comes with them stock like this one here, but there's really no support for it. So I like to take this nye rod that we use for push rods in airplanes to make stiffeners for it. It fits inside very nicely. If you have to make your own, make them out of servo wire, again using the nye rod to stiffen them. That and a piece of coax cable from an antenna extension, SMA, is all you need to make your own that in your soldering iron. There are lots of good tutorials online telling you how to do this. The Nagoya 771 antenna that came with the Immersion RC Easy UHF was junk. A lot better antenna for this application is the Diamond SRH771. It's available separately from ReadyMadeRC.com and costs about $30. I believe it's well worth it. I also replaced the monopole antennas that came with my Easy UHF with dipoles as were mentioned previously. To know what's really happening with your system, use a spectrum analyzer. They're down to several hundred dollars now for some of the handheld units. If you really don't want to spend the money, I'd recommend going with the Immersion RC Easy UHF system. The receiver that it comes with has a built-in spectrum analyzer. Now it's not going to be good for analyzing other parts of the system, such as the video uh, system or in future radio frequency projects that you have, but it will let you know the range of frequencies that the Easy UHF operates on and what's going on with those frequencies. What you're really looking for there is the noise floor and any other spikes of radio interference that might be in the spectrum that you're trying to use. A big advantage of the immersion system for the Easy UHF is that using immersion tools in the spectrum analyzer, there's another feature in there where you can actually shift the spectrum that you're using over a bit. If you're having interference from something, say, like the GoPro that's known to cause interference around 432 megahertz, you can shift this over to 435 or 437 even and get away from that. Now I found that to be a very helpful tool. When you go to purchase your UHF system, 
by quality equipment. A lot of the cheap Chinese systems might work, but they'll probably end in disappointment if you're trying for long range. There's been a lot of quality control problems with them. Most people have had the best success with Easy UHF, the Thomas Scherer systems, or Dragon Link. Range Link is also reported to be good, although I haven't tried it personally. There can be problems with any UHF system. They are more susceptible, like we mentioned earlier, to interference, especially from onboard equipment because they operate at lower frequencies. The Easy UHF has a very good reputation, but I did find a quality control problem with the transmitter unit that I was sent. The back of the circuit board has all these solder joints. The solder joints that were had to do with the antenna connection and the high and low power switch on mine had been ground round with something like a Dremel and those connections were compromised. All it took was a touch of solder on those joints and my high power worked again and my range was was much better. I would still recommend the Easy UHF system just because of the features it has and because of the excellent customer support I received at ReadyMade RC regarding it. When they learned that there was a problem with it they were more than happy to exchange it for me. Fortunately that wasn't necessary. That touch of solder on the joints on the back of the circuit board did the trick. I really hope this tech episode was helpful to you, getting your long range system working properly. If it was, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any future episodes. Fly safe and have a good one.